What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Geek Pantheon. I am Eric, and today we have another how to run. Run's not the right word. Today we're covering the Book of Cylinders from Candlekeep Mysteries, and I have a sense that this is already going to be kind of a long video, so we are going to jump straight into it. So, Book of Cylinders is developed and edited by Kim Mohan. And the reason that I start with that is because the original writer of this adventure, Graham Barber, has since asked Wizard of the Coast to remove his name from this adventure in future printings. The reason for that is that the adventure is very much not what he felt like he submitted to Wizards of the Coast for this book. Now, there is a lot to be said about the changes made to this adventure. I'm going to link below Graham's own account on his website, pocgamer.com so that you all can, if you want, get that perspective on the adventure. What I am going to attempt to do in this video is A, go over the adventure as it is presented, as it is written in Candlekeep Mysteries, and then give my thoughts on it, and then state how I would run slash fix the adventure. Now, Graham has been very vocal in the fact that because of the way that the freelance contract works with Wizards of the Coast, because Graham submitted all of this stuff in a certain order, he cannot release any of it on the DMs Guild to give his cut of the adventure. But he has spoken about some of the things that were cut in the most specific terms that he can use. Once again, this is all official Wizards of the Coast material that they chose to not release. And so there are limitations on what can be said because of NDAs and contracts, you know. So I'm gonna take what Graham has said, what I think would make the adventure better personally, because that's what I kind of do on this series of videos and present to you all how I think the adventure would really shine. So let's get into how the adventure is presented. This is a one shot. It is, I think a total of seven pages in the book and you can knock it out in a few hours. It is very much a by the numbers one shot. You have the setup, you have some travel, you have a fight, you have a bit more travel, you have another fight, it's done. There is a skeleton of a really good adventure here that I'm gonna use to build off of, but this adventure would work really well if you are wanting to try out some new classes, try out some new builds, something like that. You have a regular group and maybe a new book just dropped, like Tasha's just dropped and you all wanna try out some of the new builds and some of the new subclasses and things like that in the book. This would be a really great adventure to level everyone up to six level. It's a six level adventure. Uh, give people a chance to feel out something new and there's not gonna be a whole lot that is going to, you know, grab onto the players to say, oh, I wish we could continue this because it is very much the Gripply are in trouble. You go help the Gripply, the Gripply are no longer in trouble. That's it. So, like I said, it's a very contained adventure. There are some issues with it just off rip that if you're going to run this as a one shot, because my fix is very much build off of it into something you could insert into a campaign and launch a series of adventures off of. But if you are just running it as a one shot, the book is irrelevant, honestly. Uh, in the intro of the adventure, an NPC, Pelk, who is a dragonborn that works at Candlekeep, one of the avowed, is introduced and presents the problem to the PCs. Basically, the uh, Candlekeep trades with this Gripply village for crab meat and other pieces of giant crab that they harvest and breed, and there's issues. They're, they're not getting their shipments, so something's going on. So then the party can either travel by sea or by land. Sea is very much presented as the right choice. And I'm not being hyperbolic. Like, honestly, I'm going to read directly from the adventure. But if for overland voyage, if they don't want to take the ship, if they want to travel overland, it's going to take like a week of travel time, 100 miles in total. And this right here. In addition, you might pit the characters against some random encounters along the way to hint at the error of their ways in turning down the sea voyage. It's fine if you want to encourage the party to take a certain path. It's fine if you want to present something as an easier path forward, but you don't do it after the fact. You don't kick the party while they're traveling. 
you present that information to them very clearly. The bits about it being, well, it's going to take like a day and a half via ship. It's going to take a week over land. Okay. That probably is enough unless the party has a reason to want to travel overland or you've presented the NPC who is the captain of the ship in such a way to where he is innately distrustful, then I don't know why the party would pick overland voyage. And if they do for a reason, then don't, don't pick at them, but there are ways that you can present it. Uh, firstly, a ticking clock is a good mechanism to implement if you're wanting to encourage the party to take the faster route because this adventure very much wants the party to take the sea route so why not just present things in a way that further encourages them beyond their own convenience to take a sea route also pelk the npc that is introduced and introduces this adventure is a dragonborn and this adventure deals exclusively with gripply and the conflict between the yuan Ti. Why is the NPC that is presenting this adventure not just a Gripply or yuan Ti? And then they have some stakes and need the party's help and you can inject some emotion into it. So that's, um, that's just silly to me, uh, honestly, to make it a dragonborn. And so I, I would have it be uh, a gripply, I, I would, what I would do is I would combine Pelk and Mitor, the captain of the ship. I would combine them into one entity that is a gripply that is from the trading post slash village that is in trouble. And they have traveled here seeking help. And I have a ship. We can go now, please. I need your help. There you go. That's, that's how you can present it. If you're doing this as a one shot, that's the easiest way to present it. Eliminate the book completely as this adventure is presented. The book is interesting. Don't get me wrong. The book is super cool. The book is just a container for three uh, clay cylinders. It's the book cylinders uh, that have, the, you basically roll it in wet clay and it leaves an imp uh, impression and then you can read it that way. Super cool. Not necessary as the adventure is presented. Okay. You know what? I'm going to stop with the whole how to fix the one shot version here. And I'm just going to go through my entire how to fix it bits. And I will let you know if it's something that applies to the one shot version of this adventure, because I'm looking at my notes. I'm just going to be repeating myself a whole lot because my complaints about it as presented as a one shot are still there in the larger, more beefy version of the adventure. So yeah, let's, let's just start off with, there's no NPC that presents the problem to the party initially. Have them find the book of cylinders in Candlekeep if that's where they are, and then allow them time to solve the mystery of the cylinders. Because in the way the adventure is presented is after the problem has been presented, the NPC hands them the book of cylinders and says, oh, this might also help. And it just kind of reinforces what has already been stated, which is that there's a problem at the Gripply Village. So, let the party have time with the cylinders and let them make some checks if they want. Or if you have players that can just kind of piece together what needs to happen with the wet clay and the cylinders and stuff, let them just do it. Additionally, as the adventure is written, it's presented um, in the book. It is in Dwarven script. I would switch it to either Gripply or Primordial to once again attach it to the people that it's affecting and that this adventure centers around or abyssal slash draconic if you want to be attached to the yuan Ti, that's also fine so i would go gripply primordial abyssal draconic draconic may be the most common depending on your world and game so maybe go with that but have the pictographs on the cylinders display the problem display the gripply harvesting crab and uh, utilizing the wealth and setting up this village and then the serpent folk, the yuan Ti coming in and taking over. And on the third cylinder, it kind of shows the village all uh, abandoned, but the serpent folk have taken over the temple. I would include a final pictograph of a monstrous multi-headed snake erupting from the temple in a wave of destruction to kind of show like some stakes to it, like that, that would just compel the party to go deal with a big problem. 
that is like, oh no, this isn't just a regional like territorial dispute. Like there might be a big a big snake monster that comes out as a result of this. So we should probably deal with it. So uh, that's what I would include on the cylinders to kind of set up the problem. Then a lot of the party to, if you have somebody that speaks one of the languages, which this is how you can kind of metagame as a DM, if you have a party member that speaks primordial, gripply, abyssal, or draconic, have it be in that so one of your party members can read it. If you don't have anybody that can read any of those four languages, then I would allow them to make a check, probably an intelligence-based check, pick your poison history, arcana uh, would make sense, to pick up on keywords, keywords and phrases. Because, at least the way my brain works, when I think about like an arcana check and understanding magical script and magical language, that stuff is based out of languages that exist in the world, and there would probably be some keywords that, you know, line up. And so you could have stuff like prophecy and uh, sacrifice and summon monster destruction. <laughs> some of these keywords and phrases that while the party member making the check can't magically read the language, they're like, oh, kind of like how if you know one of the romantic languages and then you look at Latin, if you work hard enough, you can you can get there enough to like, kind of understand that's what we're going for with something like an, a knowledge based check looking at a language that the party doesn't understand that's like a prophecy so that's my thinking anyway so the other thing we're adding is stakes so big stakes there is essentially what we're doing is introducing serpent supernatural elements into the adventure so the evil yuan ti have come to the village because they are now seeking to corrupt a good aspect of the, of the world serpent that resides in this temple that the good yuan -Ti came to awaken. That's what we're going with. The Scaled Mother that's referenced in the adventure is a cult of yuan -Ti society. They all worship the world serpent, and there's a good aspect that's been put, a, put to sleep the good yuan -Ti came to wake it up. The evil yuan -Ti found out about this and have come to stop them and then corrupt the good aspect of the world serpent. That's the meta story that we're injecting into this. I, I don't understand, just to get a bit ahead of myself, at the end of the adventure, you're in a temple and there are three yuan -Ti performing a ritual. And if you don't stop them, the two good yuan -Ti that are there being held hostage die. But that's it. That's the only stakes. And I would already be concerned about the hostages dying, even if they weren't performing a ritual. If they were just in there with knives, they're like, ha ha, we have them. So you need to inject, like, what does the ritual do? Why, why are we all here right now? What's happening? They're trying to corrupt a good aspect of the world serpent. That's what we're doing. So that is the meta narrative that you are injecting in the plot as things go along especially once you get into contact with yuan -Ti. The Gripply don't care. The Gripply just had their village invaded. And that was, you hear Graham talk about this adventure, and that was really, his intent was that this is a conflict between two warring ideologies of the yuan -Ti and the Gripply are caught in the crossfire. All this stuff about good and evil aspects of the world serpent, that's, that's me, that's not Graham. The only reason I'm saying that is because I don't know who's going to see this video. Graham has been very good about not divulging stuff that he submitted to Wizards of the Coast. And if I'm anywhere in the neighborhood of what his original intent is, I don't want to risk getting him in trouble. So this stuff is all me. I just, I know the bones of what Graham intended. So based on his own writing, link down below. And before we continue, if you are enjoying this video, if you've enjoyed the other videos in the channel, or if this is your first one, Maybe give it a like and subscribe to the channel. It helps out a whole heck of a lot. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I'm happy to have you here. I'm working my way slowly, as can be seen based on the release date of Candlekeep Mysteries and where I'm at right now, through Candlekeep Mysteries, kind of script doctoring the adventures and giving my thoughts on them. So if you like that kind of stuff, subscribe down below. And then there's all sorts of other stuff on the channel. So hope you stick around. I would also in the pictographs include some landmarks maybe uh, to indicate the location of the temple village, the the stuff that's being shown, uh, a large mountain that's kind of iconically depicted as it is on maps or something like that, just to allow the party to, to kind of figure this stuff out on their own of like, oh, it's in this region. We could head there if we wanted to. 
And then it is at this point I would introduce our new hybrid NPC, combining Pelk and Mitor into one, a Gripley from the village who has come seeking people to help. Not a trade thing. It's not a, we like our crab meat at Candlekeep. It's a help. <laughs> My village was, we, we had some good Yuan tea that showed up and they were chill and cool. And they just wanted to go to the temple in our old village that we left behind because we like living closer to the water. And then some evil Yuan tea showed up and just started wrecking us. Please help. I, that, that's like, that's why adventurers do what they do. People are in trouble. Go help them. Like, yeah, because the other thing is the Gripply aren't incapable. They're just, they're traders. They're farmers. Like it's, it's just, yeah, it's just so simple. I don't know why they made it about crab meat. Okay, another thing, once they get to the trading post, because like I said, you now have a, 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 a ticking clock in the form of a desperate NPC that wants the party's help. And hey, please hop on my ship. It's a day and a half. If you try to walk, it's gonna be a week. And by that point, all my people will be dead. I don't know what could be a more compelling argument <laughs> for uh, a, an adventuring party than that. So they hop on the boat and they go, and they go to the trading post, which is where all of the Gripply refugees have fled from the village that were able to escape. And then you meet the pond mother, whether you are running it in this form or in just the simple one shot form, the pond mother knows too much. And she provides too much information. She gives the whole spiel about like, oh, so she can be the one to convey the good Yuan Ti showed up. They wanted to get to the temple in the old village. We didn't see any reason to deny them that. And they were super cool and chill. And they went up there. Then evil Yuan Ti showed up. And at this point, you just say they showed up. They started attacking our people. Those of us that got out could but please go investigate and help because we had to leave our eggs behind. And I'm very worried about that as the matriarch of our village. That's our future generations left in the hands of the enemy. Please go help. Stop it there. Because in, in it as written, she then tells them they're eating our eggs and they have, they probably have prison. She reveals all of the interesting stuff that you find out once you get to the village is what I'm trying to say. And don't have her do that. Have, the fact that the yuan -Ti have taken a lot of good yuan -Ti prisoners and a lot of Gripply prisoners, have that be a development, ha allow the party to go in thinking it was just a slaughter, and have the fact that they're eating the Gripply eggs also be a horrifying discovery. Be like, oh my God, why would you do that? That's terrible, Grogu. So yeah, that is how I would change the Pond Mother. Keep everything else the same, that's fine. I would also add, if you're doing the bigger version, some lore from the Pond Mother about how the old village where the temple is located is an ancient city that the Gripply and the Yuan Ti used to peacefully coexist in. That, that's part of the lore of that village. And there's iconography showing the Gripply and the Yuan Ti living in peace. And you could even like tie these cylinders that prophesize this attack to that village if you want, might be interesting, who knows? So add that bit with the Pond Mother. But once again, allow the urgency of the party's allies to compel them to take the quickest means of travel. Because once again, the adventurer says if they wanna go over land, there's obstacles and perils that abound and make it ter a terrible idea, but that's as deep as it goes into why they shouldn't go over land uh, and that they should take the ship. So once again, just, it's just five miles. The ship, it's going to be like an hour to get up there. I Old timey ships, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes. Uh, uh, but it's going to be a lot longer if you try to walk with all your gear through a perilous overland expedition. So that can compel the party to hop in a boat and go. I would also include something about how the surrounding area for miles is like super deep marshland with like all kinds of terrible things. Like it's, it's this natural protection for this village. And that's why the Gripply and the Yuan-Ti initially settled there is because there were this, there was this natural 
protection around. And it also prevents, once you get to the crab maze, if you look at the map, I'll show the map here. Why why don't you just drop us, see that bit of land right there next to the village that the crab maze isn't covering? Just drop us off there. And then it's like an eighth of a mile walk. Just drop us off there. That, that'll be good. We can skip the crab maze. Nope. It's sh like shoulder deep marsh right there. If you try to step off the ship, you're just going to sink. So add that bit to make the crab maze the only way forward. The crab maze, as it's written in the adventure, is just a stealth check. It's a labyrinth of platforms and rickety bridges, some of which are like two feet underwater with giant crabs walking about all over the place. And the only check the party has to make is a stealth check. It's a check every hundred feet, but still it's only a stealth check. Make it a skill challenge. Make it, make it, I know, I know skill challenges are a fourth edition thing and some people are blind to the good parts about it. Make it a skill challenge. Present the, the crab maze is such a cool set piece. Like I assume Graham came up with the idea of a crab maze. Great job. Like that is an awesome visual. There's a picture of it in the adventure. It's great. Present that as a problem to the party and then ask them, how do you want to deal with this? How do you want to get to shore? And let them come up with what checks that you need to call for. And like set it up to where each party member needs to make two successful checks before the entire party gets a collective of three failures. So if you have four party members, eight successes before two failures. If you have five, it's 10 successes. So you know math. And if they fail, giant crab encounter. And the yuan -ti are made aware that they're approaching. If they succeed, then they have the upper hand and they can sneak into the village and they don't have to fight giant crabs. Do that. Do that. And skill challenges are fun. And you should use more things from 4th edition. Another video there about the 4th edition DMG2 and all the good things in it. Moving on. As the party gets into the village, add some more story to this adventure uh, where the party can either during combat, you want can say stuff or as the, if the party's like sneaking around uh, sneaking up on the want have them overhear them talking about the fact that the good you want are an extremist cult. The, the scaled mother is an extremist cult. They're extremely good, but from the yuan perspective, they are extremists that are disrupting the, the culture of the yuan they're, they're radicals who are trying to upend who the yuan are, and that's why they fight against them. So it's not just, I mean, they're still evil. They're still eating frog babies, but they're not just, the monster card says they're evil, so they're evil. And the good ones are good, but we have to write that in the adventure because the monster card says they're evil, so they have to be evil. They're still evil, but they're an interesting evil. They're defending their way of life. They're defending their culture and, and their homeland in a way from these outside outsiders from a belief standpoint. That's interesting to me anyway. It would make me more compelled as a player to be like, oh, what's going on? That's weird. The, the evil people, I, I don't agree with them, but there's, a, I feel empathy. Is that what I feel? No, they're eating babies. I don't feel empathy, but. So I feel something. Additionally, when the party saves the like 10 good yuan -ti prisoners uh, from the Pawn Mother's house, that's when they can learn a bit more of the good perspective and how they're seeking to help awaken the good aspects because way back when the the, the evil side of yuan -ti, the ones who were more violent and sought like uh, invasion and domination over other people, they're not like can make this stuff interesting by just reflecting real stuff. Like the evil Yuan T thought it was easier to just invade neighboring creatures to expand their holdings and their territories and their resources. And that's why they're evil. But the world serpent having all these different facets was complicating that. And so the, the, the scaled mother cult believes that way back when there were sex of the evil Yuan T who shut away good aspects of the world serpent to tilt the world serpent more towards 
how they wanted to think and more violent and aggressive. And they're just trying to reawaken the, the good aspects to bring a sense of balance to the world serpent again. You can have them convey that once they're freed as prisoners. And also you can have them reference that, yeah, we're from Chult or Zendrik or insert your jungly region of your world. That's where we're from. That's where most of the aspects are that we're trying to hunt down. We just heard about this one way off where away from our aggressive, violent brethren. And so we thought this would be an easy initial win. We were wrong, but we, we need to get back home to continue our work. Sounds like a campaign hook to me, folks. Broodpool keep everything the same. They're eating the babies. And as the fight goes on, they start poisoning the, the pools with the eggs in it. That's dastardly. It's great. Uh, yeah, I would even maybe make the one, the leader there that goes around poisoning. Give them a distinct aspect, like a red cobra head, maybe. That would be interesting because there's two, you want to see Malisons there and you, there are any types. So you can make one a type one that has the snake head. Give a bright fire engine red cobra head and have the pond mother reference like one of the lieutenants or the, the martial leader of the invading force had a bright red cobra head and he was terrifying. And so then you could have him be kind of a significant lieutenant who is being even more evil than the other Yuan-Ti. And you can feel a sense of vengeance about maybe maybe he killed the pawn mother's son, husband, daughter, aunt, third cousin. Just, yeah, you can inject something like that in here and it'd be cool. The, this is like the most dastardly, evil, mustache twirling at part of this adventure. So really lean into it. Okay, at this part, you have two options. One is to continue as the adventure presents itself of the old village with the temple is just a stone's throw away and the party can get there, lickety split, and keep the temple to two areas, the courtyard and then the actual like temple, in inner temple area. Because the party is presumably low on resources at this point and there's still the ticking clock thing and you can just continue to press that and let them go, 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 go. Option two is to make it a day's journey. Like the, the old village is really far inland. And so you need to travel, you get there quick, but you also need to sleep. So that's fine if you sleep on the road and give them a long rest on the way up there or cut, split the difference, make it a short rest. And then you can add a bit more to the old village because I, I was genuinely shocked when I got to the old village section, which is the only section in the adventure with like maps. And there's there's two rooms, like which is which is very small for Candlekeep Mysteries. Candlekeep Mystery Adventures are small. This one's very small. So if you're gonna do the longer journey, give them a chance to rest, recollect their resources, then I would add a couple additional encounters to further flesh out that the Yuan T there, there is a force that's moved up there because as it stands right now, there's like three Yuan T up there, evil ones. They took a couple prisoners. So, and it doesn't even need to be hard. You can literally copy paste the two encounters from the, the village that we just got out of instead of Yuan T prisoners. There's Gripley up there. that are excavating. That's in the adventure. Just have the same encounter with the prison guards, but they're overseers for the excavators. Done. Add another room where there's a bunch of scaled mother artifacts from this temple that the good Yuan Ti would really love to have and would be really meaningful and important to them. And even one of the prisoners could reference that they heard about this and then just copy paste the, the brood pool encounter, but instead have them be smashing the artifacts. And if the adventure goes on too long, instead of poisoning, they're just like dumping over tables full of these artifacts. And if it goes on too long, all the artifacts are destroyed. That's what I would do. And then the temple feels a lot bigger and more impactful. And like, there's more stakes and stuff there. Then you get into the inner temple where the ritual is happening. Okay. You have two good Yuan T hostages. You have a Yuan T abomination, CR seven. You have Yuan two Yuan T, Malisons, one type one and one type three. 
both CR three. For anything less than six level six party members, this is a deadly encounter. So I just, I'm not, CR is not perfect. It's not even close to perfect. I'm just putting that out there that this encounter has the potential to go sideways on the party, even more so with the changes that I've made to it because they're doing the ritual. When the encounter pops off, the party has two rounds to stop the ritual before the ritual is complete. As it is presented, the ritual kills the two hostages. And that's it. That's it. What was the ritual doing? Who's to say? So how I would do it is still present the ritual as it is. They have two rounds to stop the ritual. If they do not stop the ritual, both the hostages die, sure. And then the Yuan-Ti Abomination transforms into Yuan-Ti Anathema, which is a CR 12, making the encounter beyond deadly. But it, it conveys that something happened with the ritual. Something happened. And the reason I decided to upgrade one of the monsters as opposed to adding a new monster is because you get a big impact of like growing multiple heads, becoming huge. Like it's, it's a big thing that happens and you're not shifting the action economy too wild. If you had a whole other individual in there, then you're in trouble, uh, pretend even more in trouble potentially, especially if you're trying to do something impactful, because if you add a, you want pure blood, that's CR one. That's not, that's not going to make a huge like impact uh, for the for the party. So upgrade the abomination next step up. And then I would also describe the temple as beginning to collapse. Uh, you know, maybe the temple was built over a chasm or something and it starts rumbling and stones are falling. The reason for this is it gives you an out if the party stays in fights and things go really bad. Dice just are not agreeing with the party. They're rolling hot for you, whatever. Uh, that allows the temple to collapse. Presumably the party is going to be on the side of the exit. And so the anathema and the other two Yonti can be on the other side of the collapse. They can get out and be reoccurring villains down the road, but the party can get out and live to find another day. Hopefully that won't be an issue and they can stop the ritual. But uh, I, I just think that's more impactful and it, more interesting stuff happens that way. And then the adventure can end with either way that the ritual uh, goes with the party having a call to return the good Yuan Ti home, getting them out, which the Gripply with the ship can, can help facilitate that. Or they can help the Gripply rebuild and stick around there and maybe fight in the marshlands to protect the Gripply as they rebuild. And you know, it, you can go a couple of different ways with it, or they can go back to candle keep and just go back to doing what they were doing. They can negotiate for the Yuan Ti to hop on the Gripley's boat. They can take off and they can, if your party's not interested in pursuing that line, they don't have to. But as I dramatically close my notes, that's what I would do to fix this adventure. I know this video is gonna be a bit longer than the other uh, how to run it because there was a lot more to, to fix with this one, honestly. And it's a shame because you hear Graham Barber talk about this adventure and it's clear that it's somebody who deeply has a love of the Forgotten Realms lore and was really trying to inject a lot of really cool stuff from days gone by and it just didn't it didn't end up happening and that's a real shame and I hope that this is a better version of the adventure for you all to run and enjoy like I said a couple little tweaks here and there can make this one shot work a lot better but then you can also build it out to be either still a single session or a multi-session thing that can lead to a greater story. Let me know what you all thought down below. Like I said, links for Graham's story, uh, writing for Candle Keep Mysteries down below as well. Links to all the socials and the Discord and everything. Bada bada boop boop. And subscribe to the channel, like the video. Thank you all so much. I will see you next time.